before we get into this week's episode, I want to make a plug for Art Market Minute. This is Artnet News's new micro podcast hosted by Margaret Kerrigan, who's the site's news editor, Europe. It offers a weekly snapshot of essential art market news expertly compiled by the Artnet Pro editorial team. A black woman in that situation would never be bold. And so what should she be? Bold as she could be. So she took every effort to be the exact opposite of what she absolutely could not be in those circumstances. And then she took it the extra mile. Hi, I'm Andrew Goldstein, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. Well, it's Black History Month, and we here at The Art Angle wanted to take the opportunity to devote this episode to the story of a black museum leader. We know that people of color have historically been excluded from positions of power in the mainstream art world, but that's not the full story. In many cases, black people were present, only their contributions were not properly recorded or acknowledged. In fact, what if I told you that one of the most famous museums in America was in fact founded by a black visionary, and we just didn't realize it? That, remarkably, is actually the case with the Morgan Library and Museum in New York City which was founded in 1906 to house the collection of the legendary Wall Street tycoon John Pierpont Morgan, a collection that was amassed and overseen by Belle da Costa Green, a brilliant scholar and bon vivant who we now know was black and passed as white for her entire adult life. So how did that happen? And who was Belle da Costa Green, the woman who built J.P. Morgan's peerless collection, which includes renowned illuminated medieval manuscripts, three Gutenberg Bibles, original scores by Beethoven, Mozart, and Chopin, prints and drawings by Leonardo and other Renaissance artists, and other treasures. To find out, I'm very pleased to be joined on the show today by Marie Benedict and Victoria Christopher Murray, the authors of The Personal Librarian, a sensational novel about Bell's life. Marie and Victoria, thank you very much for coming on The Art Angle. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. We're happy to be here. So I believe the story may begin in the modern epoch with Marie with you. How did you first hear the name Belle de Costa Green? I heard her name. I'm I'm embarrassed to admit how many decades ago, but it was a really long time ago. I was a commercial litigator in New York City working for a huge law firm. And I knew it wasn't my calling. And I would sneak out to the cultural institutions in New York City, including the Morgan Library, where I could kind of envision a different life. For people who have never been to the Morgan, I think it's one of the most spectacular libraries, places really, but definitely libraries in the world. And, you know, stepping in there is like stepping into a time machine. And so going back into that space was really important for me during that time as I was considering my transition to writing. And it was on one of those trips that I was walking around, taking it all in. And I happened, thank goodness, to encounter a docent who had finished giving a tour. We started talking about the incredible collection, which you just described, not just the place itself, which is magnificent, but the collection as well. And she said, did you know that a woman built this collection? It isn't just the brainchild of J.P. Morgan. And I asked her who, and she mentioned Belle de Costa Green. And I was starting to think about writing historical fiction. And I sort of put her on my list of people and topics to consider. But it wasn't until a while later that I really started to uncover the breadth of her story, that it wasn't just that she was this remarkable force in the art and library world. She really became not just a celebrity in her lifetime, but a powerhouse in terms of setting taste and authenticating things and really creating this collection. But I learned that she was actually Black, passing as white. And how did you learn that? I started to read articles about it. There was a book by Jean Strauss, I think it was the 1990s, that mentioned it. There was earlier than that, there was a scholarly article that talked about the possibility of that. I knew that there had been rumors about her background. If you look at newspaper articles and interviews and profiles of her, I mean, she was a celebrity in her lifetime. You always would see mention of things like the exotic Belle de Costa Green or the dusky complected. And so I knew it was out there, 
But it wasn't until the definitive connection was made between Belle and her father, Richard T. Greener. He should still be incredibly famous today. He was well known during his lifetime as the first Black man who graduated from Harvard, but more so as this force for equality, an orator and advocate. And as long as people didn't make that connection, Belle was all right. And during her lifetime, people never made it. Obviously, this is a spectacular story. What made you think that this was a novel and not a biography? I write historical fiction for a reason. I profile many historical women who have left important legacies, but whose identity and contributions have really been lost to history. And the reason I choose fiction to explore that is because it's only recently that women's stories and women's documentation have been considered worthy of telling or keeping. So when you go into the past to try and excavate the documentation and these lives, very often there are enormous gaps. And I really feel like it's in those gaps that we can really insert the logically derived fiction. I mean, I was a lawyer for a long time and create a much fuller, richer life than might have otherwise been depicted if we just stuck with the nonfiction biographical format. And that's especially true of Belle because there are so many things we don't know about her because she burned all of her records and she instructed everyone in her life to burn their records too. So when you go back to answer these big questions, how did she feel about passing? What did JP Morgan know about her identity? What was really their relationship like? You know, things that Victoria and I have speculated on. There isn't a definitive answer for those questions. I also think you get a broader reach with fiction. I think we're going to get a chance for more people to be introduced to her. People who would have never, ever heard of her, would never pick up a biography, but they enjoy our novels, now know about this woman. To be fair, there is a wonderful biography of her life that we refer to a lot in our telling. Heidi Artizoni wrote An Illuminated Life, I think it was 2008. And people who were interested in that format had that opportunity to really delve deep. And we invite people who want to know more to pick up that book. It's incredible. But we had a different perspective on it. And Victoria, how did you enter this mild obsession, this story? It did turn into a mild obsession very quickly. But one of the things, and actually Marie could probably talk a little bit about this, was when she decided that she really wanted to write the the Cost of Green story. Marie always says that she felt it wouldn't be fair to her to write it alone. She felt that Belle's story needed to have a Black woman as well as a white woman tell it because she lived those two lives. And so Marie read one of my novels, Stand Your Ground, where I was actually telling the story through the eyes of two mothers, a tragedy that happened to one of their sons. And after Marie read that novel, she contacted me through my agent with a synopsis of the story that she wanted to do, a treatment. And so when my agent gave it to me, I was very excited. I had done collaborations before, but the first thing I did was Google Marie. I read about how she was writing about historical women. Wonderful, but I write contemporary fiction. And then I saw a picture of her and I called my agent and asked, had Marie seen a picture of me? I think she was looking for the wrong Victoria Christopher Murray because I still didn't know the story. So my agent said, no, she's looking for you, a Black woman. And it's still took me a little bit of time to read the treatment because the first page of the treatment was mostly about J.P. Morgan, and I just was not interested. My agent kept pushing me to read the three pages, and finally I did. And when I got to that last paragraph where Marie hid the lead, where it said that no one knew that she was Black until after she passed away, I was in. And so Marie and I spoke on the phone, and from the first moment, I knew that we could do this together because not everybody can do a collaboration. And I had done others. And I know you have to almost find your writing soulmate. I knew we could do it. I wasn't sure if Marie knew. This is a remarkable story. And I wonder, just for the sake of the listener, if you could sketch the broad strokes of what we know about Belle from the historical record. For instance, 
you were mentioning that her father was the first black graduate of Harvard University, which is extraordinary. What was her family like? How did she come to pass as white? One of the things that as I was researching her at the beginning, when I first learned her true identity, it was just more remarkable than I could have ever envisioned. Her father was, I think, a second generation free man, really through his own efforts and his own intellect, became the first graduate of Harvard during this time period in Reconstruction when they were experimenting with integration. Her mother came from this incredible family, the Fleet family. There was this wonderful enclave in Washington, D.C., before, during, and after the Civil War of free, educated, affluent Blacks. They had their own community, their own rituals, social structure, and they had been free for generations. And that is the community that her mother was raised in. People went to college. They were musicians and doctors and teachers and anything you can think of. When her parents met, it was in the period of Reconstruction, which is actually very important for our story. Her mother would have never gone into the South at all during her life because it would have been too risky. If she had traveled past the Mason-Dixon line, she could have been taken as a potential escaped slave. It was very dangerous for her. Richard T. Greener had been operating as an educator in the years after he went to Harvard, and he was hired to become a professor at the University of South Carolina, again, during Reconstruction, during this time period when they were experimenting with an integrated university. He went down there. He became a professor, first of philosophy. He then became a librarian. And Genevieve, his wife, went with him in this first very bold endeavor into the Deep South. And it went well for a period of years until it very much did not go well. You know, in this time period, the promise of reconstruction of equality is starting to be eroded by fear. And that is a pattern that has happened over and over again. And that promise of equality rises up uh, white supremacy, segregation, Jim Crow laws. And that's starting to happen right during their time period at the University of South Carolina. Bell's parents are run out of South Carolina. They return to Washington, D.C. to be with Genevieve's family. That's where they live until I think Bell was about eight, maybe. And she had several brothers and sisters all there. And so she really felt what it was like during her time at University of South Carolina and her time in D.C. to embrace and be proud of her heritage. She came from this magnificent heritage. And her father, who had been a librarian and a professor, was continuing his work in advocating for equality. But it becomes more difficult as time goes on. And they eventually move to New York, where two things are happening. He has a job there. And I think Genevieve, her mother, thinks she can start to see that segregation is becoming the law of the land, no matter what the promise of Reconstruction had brought. And they move to New York City, thinking that they're going to continue to live as Black people. But bit by bit, it becomes very, I don't want to say easy. Genevieve and the kids, not Richard, they sort of slide into passing. It's a time period in New York City when there's lots of Mediterranean immigrants, and that's really what they look like. They're very fair-skinned. And bit by bit, Genevieve starts to have her and the children pass. And that creates a tremendous rift in her relationship with Richard T. Greener, who stands for the exact opposite. Genevieve recorded them in the census as white. And that's what happened. Richard said he could not live that way. That was against everything he stood for. And what I find most interesting about that time is that both parents were trying to protect their children. Richard was fighting for equality for his children. And he was saying, if we give up the fight, no one will ever achieve this. And she was trying to save her children because she knew what segregation would do. She knew what that would be like. And lynchings and everything that was happening around the country, she didn't want any part of that for her children. And I find it just fascinating that they both loved their children so much, they had to go their separate ways. So because of her mother's desire to incorporate into white society in New York City, Belle adopts this fiction that she is of Portuguese descent. And she eventually goes to work at the Princeton University Library where she starts to come into contact with the Morgan family through their patronage of the library's holdings. How does she first meet J.P. Morgan, and how does she become his librarian? 
Well, as you mentioned, she was working at the Princeton Library. We don't know her exact training, but there was really no formal training for librarians during that time period. But certainly when she was hired by the Princeton Library, it would have been assumed that she was white, despite the fact that she definitely was a little bit darker skinned and she had this exotic middle name. Just to back up one second, when the family kind of went their separate ways, Genevieve and the children changed their last name from Greener to Green to disassociate themselves so that they couldn't make that connection between them and Richard Greener. And for Russell and Belle, who were the two darkest skinned of the children, the mother added the middle name, De Costa, to give them this fictional Portuguese heritage. So when Belle was hired by Princeton Library, there's no way they would have assumed or suspected in any way that she was Black. Because it was, of all the Ivy Leagues, it was the most segregated, it was the most Southern, and she wouldn't have been hired in that position if she was Black. And so while she was there, she found they had different programming for the librarians, and she started to become more familiar with illuminated manuscripts, early printed books, and she started to take some of the classes that they had available for the librarians. Junius Morgan, who was J.P.'s nephew was very much a presence there. He had donated some early printed Virgils and a bunch of other books. He sort of haunted the library, I think, a little bit. And he struck up a friendship with Belle. And it was during that time period, Junius was sort of the unofficial consultant to JP. They both belonged to the Grolier Club um, in New York City for lovers of books, especially priceless books. And he consulted him sometimes on acquisitions. And it was during this time period in the early 1900s that JP started to construct the Morgan Library, which was right next to his townhouse. He was retiring, although he never really retired. And this was the place to house his overflowing collection and where he could kind of hang out as opposed to going down to his office. Junius was consulting with him to some extent on that. And he knew his uncle was looking for a librarian, somebody who could really assist him like a secretary, but also help curate, organize, et cetera, the collection. And he proposed the idea to Belle. And of course, as you can imagine, that was like, are you kidding me? The personal librarian to J.P. Morgan. And he arranged for her interview, which is one of our opening scenes in the book. And I mean, she eventually gained access to a near unlimited budget to travel the world and make acquisitions on J.P. Morgan's behalf, pretty much with carte blanche. And How did she convince this extremely shrewd, extremely suspicious man to endow her with so much trust? I think she went the extra step. She proved herself to him. She proved herself to him to even be hired. And then she always went the extra step. She knew that she was a woman. She knew she was a Black woman, but she knew what they So it was a woman and she was going to have to be three times better. So she went above and beyond. And I think when she proved herself, he kept saying, okay, I'll give you more. I'll give you more. And she kept asking for more responsibility. And she continued to prove herself. In the book, do you imagine... Belle and J.P. Morgan as having an intimate but a platonic relationship, although at one point they do share a kiss. And I think it's worth pointing out at this juncture that Belle is universally described as a beautiful woman. She is very alluring. So what do we know about their actual true life relationship from the historical record? And what led you guys to imagine the kiss? They spent weeks on Would they? Wouldn't they? Should they? Shouldn't they? I'll tackle this first, and then Marie will have more of a historical perspective, but this is my first historical fiction. And one of the things that I absolutely loved about this book was how we stayed as close to fact as we could, not only in terms of um, the incidents that happened, but in terms of their personality. So we learned as much as we could about JP, as much as we could about Belle. So from knowing that, just their personalities. We know that he loved beautiful women. He collected them like artwork. She was a curator of women sometimes. as he, She was managing them in the same place. Um, and so it would be hard for us to believe that he didn't have some kind of attraction to her. That would be hard to believe. 
it would be hard for us to believe that she didn't have some kind of attraction to him. She seemed to be attracted to older men, maybe a missing father syndrome, something like that. We know that they had that attraction. We talked about it and thought it through. She did answer a question once when asked, did anything ever happen? And her answer was, we tried. And so Maria and I are like, we tried. What does that mean? What does it mean? (laughs) So we gave our own interpretation of we tried based on what we knew about them. Because I just didn't believe she would go all the way because she had too much to risk to lose. So in addition to being this beautiful, vivacious, brilliant scholar, Bell was also a shark as a negotiator, really getting the best out of deals for J.P. Morgan. And she was also this flamboyant character in the public eye, wearing these bright, eye-catching fashions to the auction room and cutting an outsized, daring figure on the high society party circuit. And this is not exactly what you would think of somebody who's really hiding a personal secret doing. You would think that they would maybe kind of hide away or be a little bit more private But I guess that kind of goes hand in hand with the idea that she was hiding in plain sight at Princeton University. How do you understand the way that she wanted to live so vibrantly in the public eye? Again, we really thought about her and tried to get to know her. There's not a lot of original source material in her own voice. And she asked everyone in her life to burn her letters. But you have a brilliant woman someone, as Victoria said, who's going to go the extra mile to secure the opportunity she have. And becoming J.P. Morgan's personal librarian was literally the opportunity of a lifetime. I mean, it was life-changing for her and her family, who were very much dependent on her. So she was a quick study. In order to pass in the world in which she was passing, she would have to be an incredible read of people, a chameleon able to transform herself into whatever the situation required. Taking all that which we knew about her, which had to be true about her, and looking at the kinds of situations that she would find herself in, and then looking at what she actually did, you know, bright scarves, bold negotiation tactics. This is a woman who realized that if there were ever any doubt, if anyone ever had a question or suspicion in their mind about her identity, she should act the opposite of what they would expect. And what they would expect of a Black woman who was trying to pass as white in this very insular, rarefied world is that she would be sheepish. She would be quiet. She would be demure. A Black woman in that situation would never be bold. And so what should she be? Bold as she could be. So she took every effort to be the exact opposite of what she absolutely could not be in those circumstances. And then she took it the extra mile. If they're going to be talking about me, then they're going to talk about my scarf or my hat or my very sort of bold remark. If they're going to talk about me, they're going to talk about the way that I pulled a whole collection out from Lord Amherst's grasp at the London auction, right? She wanted people to talk about those things rather than the suspicions that she knew were out there about her. Hiding in plain sight, being bold was a sure way to draw the right kind of attention. And so you talk about her public record, how she burned all of her papers and she asked everybody to burn all of her correspondence as well. There was one person, however, who did not burn her correspondence. Who was that and why is that significant? Oh my goodness, that's Bernard Berenson, a man who she first met around the age of 10, not in person, but through a gift that had been given to her of his book. And then she met him again when she was an adult. And for some reason, he became the love of her life, the absolute love of her life. I think it was intellectual and a mutual love of art. It wasn't physical, though that's where it went. But what she loved was him, his mind, and he loved her mind. But talk about dysfunctional relationship. His wife gives him permission to have an affair with this beautiful young woman. The way we imagine it, the wife gets together at lunch and says, oh, go on, next time you come to see him, maybe it'll be the three of us. (laughs) And so it was an interesting relationship that lasted forever. And so just for the listeners at home, Bernard Berenson was one of the great art historians of his time, of uh, specialist 
in the Italian Renaissance and also kind of a slightly shady go-between in the art market. So he preserved their correspondence, but I don't believe in their correspondence there was any hint about her secret truth. How did that eventually get discovered? That, I think, was done by research as time went on and there were better access to documentation and records. The link between Bell and her father, Richard T. Greener, was made. And that happened in the 80s and 90s. And it was really deeply explored in Heidi Artizoni's book in, I think, 2008. And that's another reason why fiction is such a satisfying way to explore Bell's story is because the biggest wealth of original source material that we have in Bell's hand and by someone who knew her intimately are those letters by Bernard Berenson that she had asked him to burn that he kept in a trunk at Itati, which was his villa in Italy, which ultimately became part of Harvard University. And those letters were almost kept as journals. You know, she didn't write one letter and post it. She kind of kept a letter and wrote over a course of a week about things that were going on in her life and what she thought about certain people. And as Victoria mentioned, they were really deeply connected intellectually on artwork. He was, as you said, really the preeminent art historian of his day, particularly in the Italian Renaissance. In some ways, he kind of brought it back to life again by kind of explaining it to the people of the Gilded Age, bringing the artists to life, explaining what the paintings meant. It was sort of a lost symbolism that he made accessible and attractive to them. And so there was that, I think, that really connected them intellectually. And they wrote about that as well. When he died, those letters surfaced and they were only accessible at Itati. They had not been digitized in any way. But one of the things Victoria and I are really excited about is, you know, the Morgan Library is doing this huge celebration of the hundred years of it becoming a public library in 2024. And as part of that, they're really going to celebrate Bell and they're digitizing all those letters. And that is going to be such an incredible treasure trove and insight into Bell's mindset and her world that really was inaccessible before. One of the things that was supposed to happen during COVID was I was supposed to go and actually study the letters myself. But of course, that wasn't possible. So we were very beholden and very grateful to Heidi Artizoni because she excerpted many of those letters in her biography. But you're right, there was no mention of her identity in those letters. What would you say was her greatest achievement at the Morgan Library? Making it a public institution, because it wasn't easy for her to make that happen. But one of the things that Marie always says is that there's so many riches inside that place. And if it had not been for Belle de Costa Green, they would not be accessible to the public. I totally agree. I think for Belle, she had made so many sacrifices when she passed. You know, she had to live in an authentic life. She had to give up having a family. She couldn't risk having a child that would reveal her secret. So the thing that she sacrificed herself for had to be worth it. It had to be monumental. And just creating this wonderful library for the benefit of one or two people Knowing Belle as we do, I don't think that would have been worth the sacrifice for her. But to make it available for everyone, scholars, to just people who want to pop in, that's a huge legacy to leave behind. And one that she, I think, I don't know what do you think, Victoria, she would have been really, I think she thought her father would have been proud of. Yes. I think she thought her father would have been proud of it. I think she would have been proud of everything that she sees with it today except those letters. I don't think she's going to be happy. And so sometimes I think, do I want to read the letters because Belle's going to get mad? And I'm like, yeah, I want to read the letters. Now, over a century has passed since Belle became J.P. Morgan's librarian. And while Black women have made enormous strides in American society and in the art world as well, taking leadership roles at museums, galleries, and other institutions, there remain many glaring shortfalls in terms of representation in the art world. So... How do you see Bell's achievements in this context, given that to the world at large, she achieved them as a white woman and not a black woman? This is a good question. This is a question I haven't had, but it's something that I thought about because she made the achievements as a white woman, but she made those achievements as a white woman to the white world. She was still black. She learned everything as a black woman. She was still a Black woman as she went in and did all of those things. She was not white. She was Black. That's how I see her. 
I see what she did, what she wore was just a mask. And that every day she had to take that mask off. But to go out into the world and survive, she put the mask on. But her soul, who she was, she was a Black woman. And so it's very easy for us to recognize and accept it because so many of us have to wear masks. Would you say that Belle's story is unique? Or since writing this book, have you come across other figures from prominent roles in society at the time? who we now know were actually black and were passing as white. You know, we're writing a second book and we have other books in the works. There's an endless number of either black women who've passed or black women who are responsible for things, but who have gone overlooked or had their accomplishments claimed by somebody else, usually a white man or a white woman. So I don't know what you think, Victoria, but I think we're finding her story, but I think her story is emblematic of so many stories. And I think to see her, to know that she was hiding in plain sight for all those decades, because she ran that museum into after World War II, she ran it for decades, I think allows all of us, but especially Black women, to know what's possible, to know that a Black woman was out there claiming her space for all those decades. And that that's just the beginning of so many more to come. You know, Richard T. Greener wrote this incredible essay, which has kind of been forgotten to time. It's called The White Problem. And in that essay, he talks about the problem with the sort of reaction to reconstruction. Wasn't that there was something wrong with Black people. The problem was that white people had all these preconceptions about Black people that weren't true. And he then went on to make this huge list of all these incredibly accomplished Black people, politicians and musicians, and some of whom many people had never heard of, but who had made these enormous contributions. And we like to think that his own daughter would have been like top of that list to show all of us what's possible. You mentioned that her story really emerged in the 80s and 90s, and now today the Morgan Library is really celebrating her as the key figure, aside from J.P. Morgan, of course, in the creation of the library. And I think that a lot more people are going to know her story soon because of your book and also because now TV icon Al Roker has optioned the rights for a limited series on TV, which I think is going to be a gigantic blockbuster. So how is that shaping up? Oh, my gosh. It's like a dream come true. We met Deborah Roberts, his wife, on the set of Good Morning America. She interviewed us. We were selected as the Good Morning America book club pick last summer. And we just connected with Deborah right from the start. Yeah, she was saying, we're friends now. We were leaving the interview. And she loved this book. And she, like, forced it out to read. And because she knew it was a history buff. They told us right away they were interested. But we're so excited because of the ideas and the thoughts. And I've been blessed to have a few of my other books made into movies, but I've never worked with someone who had the love for the book that is almost greater than my love. She loves this book. They're like dream partners. They really are. Their passion for the story and the way that they see Belle is so in line with, with what we see of Belle. It's, it's incredible. So speaking of people who love the book, two people who I know who love the book are my mom and my aunt, who both read this before I did, and they told me about it, and they convinced me this is the most incredible story. So I have a question that both of them would like me to ask you, and that is... J.P. Morgan, incredibly smart, ruthless, and suspicious. Do you think that the whole time they had this intimate, close friendship, all these years of working together, that he never suspected that she was Black? Yeah, that's a question that Marie and I asked every day that we were writing. First of all, I will bet all the money that I have in your mother and your aunt and you and Marie, that when she came to him, He did not know. She came to him on a white platter. She came to him from Princeton. I would bet everything he didn't know. She would have never been hired. But we've gone back and forth on what could have happened because if he had found out, 
it would have gone one of two ways. He would have said, I'm going to destroy you the way you tried to destroy me and come in here. Or he could have said, look, you're white now. You're going to stay white. There were so many rumors about him and her and rumors about him and children he had. I'm not sure how much he paid attention to that stuff. We have talked about this and looked at it every which way. I mean, there were rumors that she was his daughter. The rumors were all over the map. I mean, I think we both definitely think that he didn't know when he hired her. Maybe he bought the Portuguese thing. He knows that Princeton University wouldn't have hired a Black librarian for sure. Over time, maybe he heard the rumors. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he had his own suspicions about her. But one thing's for sure. At a certain point in time, she became so integral to him in his life. She really did become one of the most important people to him, one of the closest to him, that even if he had his suspicions, she was white in his eyes. And if JP Morgan said you were white, by God, you were white, right? And so if there were rumors out there, that alone in his mind would have put an end to it. We definitely talked that one through and we definitely envisioned a scenario in which he questioned her, you know, and thought maybe he could have been enraged and exacted retribution because he certainly did that to other people. Well, let's see. Maybe the series will shed more light on this question. Well, congratulations. And thank you both so very much for coming on to talk about this incredible story. And best of luck with where this story goes from here. Oh, thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. Well, that's it for this week's episode of The Art Angle. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, take a moment to rate and review us. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. The Art Angle is produced by Sonia Manoli, Tim Schneider, and Caroline Goldstein. Thanks for listening, and see you next week.